Yeah, can I start? Thank you. Welcome to everyone watching uh, this webinar on the state of uh, EU journalism uh, in 2020. My name is Stefan Alonso. I'm uh, the foreign affairs editor in The Hague for the Dutch newspaper NRC Handelsblad. Uh, previously, I was a correspondent in Poland, in uh, Central Europe and in Brussels writing about the EU. So uh, I can truly say that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, wonderful to be back, even if it's for one virtual hour, to talk with some of the people I've worked with in the past and whose work I uh, admire. Um, so hi there, everybody. I don't see everybody, anybody yet, but soon uh, you will appear. Uh, I want to kindly thank uh, the Dutch permanent representations for letting me moderate this event, uh, which will be about the state of European journalism. And before I start, I would like to say that the audience is invited to send in their questions uh, through the chat function, which should be visible. And um, uh, please also indicate if you want your question to be answered by any specific person in our panel today, and we will come back uh, on that uh, at, uh, at the end. Uh, so before we talk about European journalism, let me first jump to American journalism. Recently, I've been spending over hours, like everybody else, watching CNN. And one thing that struck me is how outspoken they were about Donald Trump. Uh, the president was not just not telling the truth, he was plainly lying. Uh, other American news channels would also plainly interrupt press conferences stating that what the White House was stating could not be verified and uh, would therefore not be shown on live television. Um, a clear standoff between media and authorities which made me wonder, is this what we are up to in the EU? Or maybe we are already there, or maybe we're already past this stage. And what does this mean for the independence of journalism? Uh, is press freedom and media independence under threat in the EU and its member states? I will be reflecting on these and other questions with EU correspondents Khan of the Financial Times, uh, David Hershenhorn from Politico, Katalin Halmai from the Hungarian newspaper Nepsava, and Tomasz Bielecki, who is working for the Polish uh, edition of Deutsche Welle and uh, the Polish daily Gazeta Wyborcza. And how nice to see all of you now. Um, maybe I start with you, Katalin. Uh, According to Reporters uh, Without Borders, your country, Hungary, has made a dramatic fall in the Press Freedom Index from, uh, uh, it, I think it was 10 years ago, it was number 23 in the, in the list, and now it's, uh, it's number 89. Um, so I, I would like to ask you, um, uh, you know, is independent journalism still possible in Hungary, according to you? Uh, thank you, Stefan. It's good to see you again. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Yes, being an independent journalist is extremely difficult uh, uh, in my country. According to some calculations, 80% uh, of the media market uh, um, uh, belongs to the pro-government and, and public, uh, public media. This calculation is based uh, uh, on, uh, on the revenue. Um, um, the, the, the market is, is, is absolutely distorted um, according to the Hungarian advertising association. The state is the single largest uh, advertiser in Hungary. Uh, over the past few years, it spent, they spent uh, hundreds of millions of euros um, uh, on advertising and they almost exclusively advertise with pro-government uh, outlets. Privately owned companies are also very cautious about where they advertise, uh, not wanting to upset uh, the government, like uh, some foreign companies, uh, of course. Just, just let me give you an example. Um, uh, a couple of months ago, an investigative news portal, Direct Harm uh, 36, published a story entitled How Orban Played Germany. The reporter of this investigative news site was told by senior editors of a Hungarian weekly magazine uh, that they have been unsuccessfully hustling for advertisements from large foreign companies for a long time and they have been turned away uh, everywhere. When one of them, one of the editors, met a representative of a German car maker, the gentleman told him, Please understand, we can't advertise in your paper because we don't want to risk the state subsidy given, given to, to, to our factory. Um, yes. So, 
yeah, uh, yeah, the situation is very, very severe, and uh, uh, the, the remaining independent uh, uh, newspapers, um, uh, media outlets are really fighting for their existence, uh, for, for their survival. So, so uh, uh, j just a little follow-up question on this. Uh, recently, we had uh, the affair of uh, Mr. Shire, the member of the European Parliament. Uh, uh, you know, in Dutch media, uh, all the details were there. Can you explain to me how uh, uh, Hungarian media um, informed the public about what happened in Brussels? Yes, of course. Um, I just um, researched a little bit the the pro-government and public media after that affair. And uh, if you are the reader or an audience uh, of, of this, this media, uh, from their reporting, uh, you would have only learned that Mr. Sire had apologized to his family and to his daughters because he, he broke the COVID-19 um, uh, measures uh, by participating in a house party. Uh, in Brussels. So not a single word about a gay, gay sex party and how it exposed the hypocrisy uh, of Fidesz uh, and the government. So they had to buy your newspaper to find out? Yes, I, yes, I, I worked a lot <laughs> on that, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, Tomasz, um, uh, your country, Poland, is on the uh, 62nd place on the Press Freedom Index. Um, you know, earlier I talked about uh, how CNN, uh, you know, obviously became a player in the standoff with Trump, whether they like it or not, in a way. Uh, to what extent would you say uh, journalism in, uh, in Poland has become uh, politicized? Yes, thank you. I'd say that the, 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 the journalism and some mass media outlets, uh, newspapers, uh, so on, are even more politicized in Poland than 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 than, than CNN currently. One okay. uh, has to say that this uh, uh, model of uh, politically involved media is a traditional model in post-communist Poland. So, newspaper I, I work for, Gazeta Wyborcza, uh, it was yes created uh, after the collapse of communism as a direct con continuation of underground weekly, illegally uh, edited. So, uh, the line uh, was from the beginning to be involved politically, not to pretend to be neutral. But uh, obviously, in the recent five years. Uh, it got uh, more intensified. Uh, the, the, the political involvement is more intensive. I'd say that for many editors uh, and and the mass media, uh, the, the the current uh, uh, government and, and recent five years uh, means uh, to means, means working in the emergency mode. It's not about the uh, usual, ordinary democratic alternation of, of, of ruling parties. It's about the democracy and authoritarianism, or the risk of growing authoritarianism, rule of law and not, uh, 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 and uh, infringement of rule of law. And it it is considered as a uh, as a not only justification but as a good reason to be even more politicized, less neutral. Uh, uh, and um, obviously, it uh, it it leads to risks for for journalism. I'd say because the line yeah. uh, between kind of uh, between uh, uh, the newspaper being uh, politically not neutral, involved, pro opposition anti-governmental or pro opposition, uh, the line between this stand and uh, between I'd say even being one of the centers uh, of opposition, democratic opposition in Poland is very blurred. And it's quite risky for journalists, and also it leads to to, to the fragmentation of the uh, of the society and of the uh, our readers because we are closing ourselves in the bubbles of the readers believing trusting the mass media, and not trusting at all to 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 to, to the mass media of the other side of the government side and vice versa. Which yes, it's also an American problem I think, but it's also yes, uh, growing more and more uh, stronger in Poland now. So, so you know, just to, to go a little bit back in history, why why was it actually like that that Gazeta always felt this urge to be politically involved? What was the reason yes, behind I, that? Yes, as I yes, uh, it was created uh, yes in uh, uh, 1989. 
uh, at the time of the first uh, party free elections in Poland, is at, the, at the time of the transition from communism to post communism, and, and as, a, as a newspaper uh, s uh, being a continuation of the illegal anti communist uh, weekly, it was obvious for, for editors at the time and journalists to, to support democracy, to support not communist but pro democratic source, uh, uh, forces in the first elections, uh, to support the, uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the NATO accession, EU accession. It was always about the fighting for, 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 for this Western, pro Western uh, line of the Polish development. As you know, as a, as a former correspondent in, in, in Poland, Gazeta Wyborcza, even its name, it's in fact, electoral gazette, yes, because it was yes, created yes. for the sake of the anti-communist opposition uh, in '89 as a concession from uh, made by the communists, just giving uh, illegal opposition uh, the, the first legal newspaper to, to campaign legally uh, in elections. Of course, now no one remembers the context, or almost no one, and this report, this electoral, just uh, sounds. Uh, uh, in in other way, but that's that's the beginning. And obviously, editorial staff is still uh, made of some people uh, of working there this 20, 30 years ago. And uh, now yes. there is uh, yes the spirit of of, of uh, coming back to the to, to, to the fight for democracy. Yes, that is uh, this emergency mode which is very present at at, at, at Gazeta Wyborcza and some other mass media uh, outlets. Yes, yes. So we're we're back in uh, we're back in the eighties, basically. That, that's interesting. Um, um, and Marine, uh, uh, welcome. Also, um, uh, you recently had your own uh, standoff with a president. Um, uh, you know, uh, a column you wrote was uh, uh, retracted by the Financial Times after uh, President Macron uh, complained about it. If if I uh, uh, if I'm you know giving the correct. Uh, 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 you know, summary of what happened. Um, is, is this something you've experienced ever before? And how can you maybe tell us a little bit how this has influenced your life? I mean, what has what has been going through you in the last couple of weeks? Hi, Stefan. Thank you for having me. Um, uh, good question. Um, yeah, for people who don't know, I think it's probably been about a month, uh, five weeks, where uh, I wrote an op-ed about um, uh, the French government's uh, separatism, anti-separatism laws, which were very much in the context of terrorist attacks. Um, and the, Mr. Macron wrote a reply in the FT. So he had the right to reply uh, in a letter, which was published in the FT, I think the next day, um, where he uh, accused the media, uh, refuted the idea that media articles should divide France, that um, the French government is not attacking Islam, but uh, a category of crime he calls Islamist separatism. Uh, and yeah, I think it became a furore, which being in a small town in Brussels, people saw playing out very publicly. I mean, I'm sure you know, and everyone else here that, you know, we, as newspapers, we give the rights of reply um, to people. The fact that the French president yeah. was so exercised to um, want to reply to something that he'd read in the FT. I mean, personally, as a journalist, um, I think that's great. Um, we want to uh, press as many buttons of as many powerful people as possible. I think there was a, maybe I think I was surprised, a lot of people were surprised by the nature of Mr. Macron's uh, response. Um, it was pretty tough. Uh, he was not holding, uh, uh, holding his punches and subsequently he went on to do other interviews in English speaking press like the New York Times, um, making this argument that there's a fundamental misunderstanding that the Anglo um, or English speaking press have about France and its peculiarities and its uh, specific uh, ideas about secularism and laicite. Um, and at the time, yeah, I mean, it was, it's strange to be uh, part of the story as a journalist. It's very odd to be on the other side. I guess it, it was, uh, it's, I, I wouldn't recommend it to anyone, but it's quite a good way to understand the thing that I do every day, which is call people up and ask them about what it's like to be part of the story. So um, in some senses, it was quite a humbling experience. I think overall, um, I would hope that the arguments that I was making, even though they're no longer available to read on the FT, um, I think in some degrees have been vindicated by events which have happened since in France. Um, and there has been a lot more scrutiny actually about um, this government's policies about separatism, its anti-terror laws, um, its police laws, etc. And I think um, in, in some ways, if anything good could have come out of this, um, this saga is that there is 
a, a genuine appreciation that things that are happening in France, because France is a huge country, it influences a lot of the European debate. And my perspective writing an op-ed wasn't as a French person, but it was as somebody who was watching, but on a theme, which is the place of religion, Islam, minorities, in Europe is a theme which has been played out in various countries. Stefan, you will know this much better than me because the Netherlands has been having this conversation, you know, for probably longer than any Western country, maybe over 30 years. Um, yes. And you see recurring tropes about the way Muslim communities are spoken about, how policymakers try and contrive anti-terrorist laws. And my argument basically in the op-ed was that you have to be very careful in the way that you um, think about um, Islam because I still feel there is an obvious uh, and and quite dangerous lack of recognition that Muslims are also European citizens in the countries they live in. They are voters, they are citizens, they are impacted by the same sort of um, things. Uh, and the Macron episode, um, I would hope that um, people would not think that the FT, I mean, the piece was taken down because of factual errors and is not available to read. The weird thing is that, you know, on the internet, everything is really available to read. Um, but it, it has sparked yeah, but, a debate around this question. Sorry, go ahead. But fact, you know, factual errors uh, in my newspaper, factual errors are usually just corrected with a, you know, uh, uh, with, with a little note underneath saying, you know, in the previous version of this article, we made a factual error. We, 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 uh, we, we put it right and now it's, you can read it again. Uh, but but this was not the decision taken by your, your newspaper. It seems quite a radical step, right, to uh, take off an article online. Uh, yes, it is. And I, uh, I mean, I'm not going to speak on behalf of the FT or its editorial processes because I can only say what I, um, what I wrote. But they didn't feel that they could stand by the article in, its, in, in that form. And, um, and the president was given a, a right of reply. Um, the weird thing about the internet is actually you can't really ever take stuff down. Um, yeah, censorship is, uh, is impossible. <laughs> it is actually impossible. I mean, it's yeah. it's the beauty yeah. and the curse in some senses that the fact that we have a website means that anyone in the world could read anything that's published on the FT. But it also means that once it's been published, it's very difficult to take it down. Uh, I think it was a bizarre yes. situation when you have a where you have a letter in response to something that doesn't exist. But my only hope was that enough people managed to read it initially and. Uh, and, and subsequently have seen the way that the, I think there has been a, a tendency among this government particularly to have this a bogeyman of the Anglos, Anglo-Saxon or the English speaking press. Um, and my argument is that like any in any co country covering any country, that sometimes it's the international press that plays a very, very vital role just because they are sometimes a step removed from some of the more domestic um, internal debates. They're probably less subject to the immediate political pressures that domestic journalists are when they're covering their own governments. And one thing that yes. I've noticed as, as somebody who covers, the, uh, who covers the Netherlands from Brussels is that when I speak to Dutch ministers, it's usually always in the Brussels context. And that's something that they quite like because when ministers come to Brussels, they're representing the Netherlands or their country on a specific issue. And yes. because I have to cover occasionally domestic Dutch politics, um, when I ask Dutch ministers about things that are happening at home in their own, um, you know, domestic parties, uh, they don't really like it, actually. And uh, exactly. it kind of, exactly. uh, and it, it's kind of jarring for them. You know, I, I, I've had some ministers sort of look at me quizzically and say, well, why do you care about my party's leadership campaign? I mean, you're the Financial Times. Why would you, you know, surely we're just here to talk about the digital tax. Um, so Absolutely. it's quite it's, it's quite a funny it's quite a funny dynamic, and it, I, I'm sure in this case I, I imagine that uh, President Macron probably didn't like the idea that there was a Brussels correspondent who was speaking about domestic debates in France. Yeah, that, that brings me to to to, to David. Uh, very uh, welcome, I would say, also to you. Um, I, I would say, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but political holds a special place in the European media landscape in the sense that it's not really related to any you know, particular European country, let's say, what we just talked about, right? That's, that's you know, there is no, I mean, does, does that make your life uh, easier uh, as a journalist, would you say, or doesn't it matter? Well, Stefan, first let me say it's great to be with everybody in honor of World Press Freedom Day. Uh, thanks very much. And also, you know, as the, the disclaimer, as Maureen said, that I'm here speaking in a personal capacity, not on behalf of Politico. You all know where to, where to find the official comment or quote, if you need it, yeah. uh, from uh, Politico's leadership. But I do tell everyone, one of the things that I personally love the most about Politico Europe, and in this way, it's distinct from uh, our sister publication, our older sister publication in the US, 
uh, politico.com, is that we are this great experiment in stateless journalism. We have this uh, big newsroom in Brussels that's very uh, multinational, uh, multilingual. The ownership is half American, half German, but it's neither an American nor German publication. We're in Belgium, but obviously not Belgian, although we have some terrific Belgian journalists uh, working with us. And so in that sense, you don't have the burden, as, as Maureen is describing, the burden that can follow both politicians and journalists around of that national allegiance. If we talk about, for example, when I worked uh, most of my career at the New York Times, if a, if a New York Times reporter is in Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, in places where the American military is uh, operating, often the question is, what are we doing here? We as in, we the Americans. At Politico Europe, there, there is no we in that sense. Um, so that mm -hmm. is freeing uh, for sure to not have uh, that um, affiliation or, uh, or predisposition in people's minds about uh, who the coverage might represent. On the other hand, it does have a burden because as you know, uh, there is a home, home field advantage that sometimes goes with having your perm rep in town where the, uh, the civil servants, the apparatus might feel a little bit of loyalty, want to help out, uh, advance an agenda, yes. yours and theirs. Uh, so sometimes, you know, we don't, because we don't specifically say reach the Italian audience or the Spanish audience or the German audience, uh, if somebody's trying to target in that way, uh, they might go elsewhere. But I think there's a, there's a trade-off, there's a balance that makes that worthwhile. So, so as a you know, as a relative outsider, I mean, uh, I, I apologize for calling you like that, but I mean, <laughs> you are kind of a little bit. Uh, uh, do, do you think that uh, when you hear these stories about Poland, Hungary, now the thing with Macron, although you might, I mean, is it is it really uh, is it really a fight about about you know media freedom or is it a fight about a fight about cultural differences? I mean, this this uh, remains in the open a little bit, but still, you get this feeling that you know the media. Uh, is kind of under pressure everywhere. I mean, is this is this something you would agree to, and is this something you you you've seen you know uh, aggr you know getting worse in the last couple of years in in Europe? Well, well, speaking as the as the American interloper here on the enlightened uh, continent, I would say it, it's actually it strikes me as something even even more profound. You know, some of the debates that we're confronting, uh, the reaction that you had to CNN, for example, uh, some of the statements that are made by correspondents on the air where they're they feel compelled to make a value judgment, not just to say yeah. that something, uh, say President Trump said was false, but that it was disgraceful. Going beyond the, the fact checking to an actual value judgment suggests the extent to which places that have a long tradition of vibrant media freedom are now in a very different kind of dynamic where the media is almost pushed into an oppositional role because of the, the, the lying and disinformation by people in positions of power. Now we have to remember, uh, from my perspective, this is this is a, in a way a, a privileged problem, right? I, I spent four years uh, living and covering Russia in countries, and as, as Tomas was saying, in countries where there is a, a more recent history of totalitarianism and authoritarianism, where press freedoms aren't taken for granted, almost by definition, if you're working in media and trying to convey free and fair and true information, you're immediately put in an oppositional role. So folks are sometimes more comfortable in that tension because it's built in. I've been invited, for example, to, to, to Belarus long before these recent uh, elections to talk to local reporters about covering legislative elections. And, and what I'd say to them is, you tell me, your job is much harder. I come from places where it's very easy to cover these elections because nobody is trying to squash the opposition. Nobody's trying to muzzle um, anyone. But I think we are experiencing something much deeper and much more profound where you now have a situation where the very question of truth is being debated. And I don't think we've figured out how to push back on that exactly in the, in the right way. I know that the last four years in the American press, watching my colleagues from afar, trying to cover Donald Trump, it, it definitely didn't work as well as it could have or should have. You hope that, well, down the line, you might not have this kind of fight sort of going on where the press is forced into an oppositional role, but also, you have this question of vulnerability. We're always vulnerable to our sources. And when your sources lie, even when they're in the highest positions of power, how obligated are you to continue quoting them, to continue giving them airtime? I mean, Marine's experience shows that even politicians who think of themselves as progressive, as liberal, as democratic, want to control us and the message that we carry under any circumstance. They want to control what readers and viewers are hearing about them. That's a built-in tension always. 
and we always have to yes. be guarding against it. When, when we actually have a situation where facts are in dispute, where people try to tell us that, that down is up and up is down, you know, then you have a real fundamental challenge, the likes of which I don't think we've quite experienced, at least in the, in the, in the Western uh, journalistic tradition. And we need to quickly figure out how to deal with that. Yes, so, so Kata, thank you for that. Uh, Katalin, uh, uh, you know, but what we're basically hearing here is that uh, objectivity is, uh, is uh, dead, right? I mean, uh, truth doesn't exist anymore. I mean, um, uh, is, is, uh, you know, how, could, you, could you reflect on that? What, if, what, how, how this looks in Hungary and, 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 and if you see, what kind of a solution do you see to this uh, situation where we find ourselves in? Uh, yes, um, you are right. It, um, it's, it's a very delicate question. And um, when, when you talked about the uh, politicized media uh, before, um, Hungary is a textbook case, textbook, uh, case for that uh, because there is uh, already a very close link between the political actors and, and the, the owners uh, uh, of the media. Um, so, um, the, the uh, very fragmented uh, uh, media market uh, um, uh, gives rise to, to different uh, uh, different interpretations uh, uh, of the of the of the facts. Uh, unfortunately, um, on both sides, uh, and we have a very very secretive uh, government which hinders the the access uh, uh, to the information uh, by all means. Um, so it's 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 very difficult uh, to cover um, events uh, um, when 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 uh, you you cannot have access to basic public uh, information um, and you have to go to the court uh, for for uh, uh, obtaining uh, the information about the COVID nineteen uh, uh, pandemic, uh, for example. Uh, so access um, uh, to the information is, um, uh, is, 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 a, is a very, very big problem for, for uh, um, journalists working uh, for the independent uh, uh, press in Hungary. Uh, I, we, we have a new um, news portal, Telex, which published a story about the access of information, access to the information, and uh, uh, they, they basically their conclusion is that the function of media to provide information is severely damaged uh, in Hungary. Uh, since the yes. beginning of October, this news site sent 225 questions to the so-called operational staff, which holds daily press conferences about the COVID-19. Uh, they have never received a response. Uh, they asked. They're being, uh, they're being they, ignored they asked, completely. Exactly. They asked 31 times for permit to make photos in 12 different healthcare facilities to show what the front line of the fight against the pandemic looked like, and they have not received a single one. So, what is happening uh, in the hospitals remain hidden uh, from the public, uh, from the public eye. In Hungary, do you, do you think that do you think that COVID uh, has made the situation worse in a way in in Hungary? You mean from That's the it. perspective of journalists? Yeah, yes, from the perspective of journalists. Yes, yes. Yeah, definitely. Yes, the, the main the main yes. problem the, the main problem is 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 the state <laughs> again, um, which um, which uh, basically prevents uh, journalists from doing their job, uh, and uh, the problem is not only the information which is not provided by state authorities. The problem also is that uh, um, the healthcare staff is prevented. Uh, from giving information, the doctors, nurses, uh, healthcare providers, uh, they do not dare to give information to families because they, uh, they, they are afraid of, of uh, consequences. Uh, and of course, uh, when it comes to, to the uh, working conditions of journalists, that is also severely damaged uh, by the pandemic. Uh, they have to work from home, uh, and um, their salaries are 
um, sometimes uh, uh, decreased. So many psychological problems we also face uh, as journalists, yes. so and many, many problems uh, with the COVID-19. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, uh, Tomasz, um, uh, of course, the, the, you know, we, we are all dying to know what if there is a solution to all of this. And, and I wanted to ask you, do you feel that, for example, you know, there's been some time for some time now, some talk about maybe the EU should take an initiative to kind of offer more protection to, to journalists uh, in one way or another. Uh, is this is this something uh, is this is this an idea that you that you support? I mean, what, what, what how do you look at this? Yeah, uh, when you have problem, yes, usually we call for the European Commission and Brussels and EU, which should help exactly. some, <laughs> somehow. In fact, I don't see the the, the easy way for to, 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 to. We are talking about the context of the EU member states, not about the protection of journalists in the in the in the countries where where their lives are at risk, like Russia, Belarus, yes. and so on. Um, in the EU, it's uh, not so easy, I'd say. And uh, I think that the best way for, for, for the EU institutions, for the EU, for Brussels, would be just to uh, to, to implement the, ru the rules which, which are, yes, which are uh, now in, in, in its legal text. From the Polish point of view, just uh, the, 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 the situation is far better in Poland than in Hungary, and the and, uh, and media market has been quite uh, pluralistic until now. Of course, the COVID and, and this corona crisis is now uh, worsening the economic situation uh, of independent mass media, whilst the state, uh, uh, so called public, but state mass media, pro government media are generously fed by, uh, by, 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 by the government direct either directly or, or through the state-owned companies. It's just a question about illegal state aid. It should be uh, persecuted by the European Commission and ECJ with the tools uh, which are deeply rooted in the single market um, logic and rule book. Uh, uh, I'd say that for Poland, for now, for, 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 for keeping the, the pluralistic media, mass media market, this state aid issue, would be enough. In fact, we have the news of yes, just yesterday, the, the, the state-owned company, Energy Giant, uh, they announced that they are buying from the, the German owner the, the 20, uh, 20 out of 24, the relevant regional weeklies, uh, tens of uh, dailies, tens of, uh, of, of, of weeklies and, and hundreds of, of websites covering uh, local uh, news. Uh, and uh, yes, the, the, the explanation is, is uh, is very easy as it was with Gazprom media in Russia uh, 15, 20, 12 years ago. They are ready to pay far more than any uh, any uh, commercial and private uh, uh, market player would would be ready to do it, to to, to do and to pay. So uh, we are the phase at which I think Hungary was 10 years ago, eight years ago, uh, and this. Um, uh, a kind of the um, monopolization of, of, of mass media by, 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 by the government, which is not the problem now in Poland, I, I repeat, but it's it's a risk uh, that the, the, of the process uh, uh, just uh, being uh, conducted uh, uh, through the state aid, which is apparently illegal under, under European Commission, under EU rules. So the way it's easy. When you say state aid, you mean the the, the mechanism where uh, uh, companies yes, are, 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 yeah. are are massively buying advertisement space in uh, in state-owned uh, media outlets and things like that. Both right? advertise, I mean, yes, yes, yeah, yeah, and yeah, uh, also, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, 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 so your 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 point is that the EU should kind of intervene in this and should kind of uh, uh, make sure that the, the the media landscape remains uh, pluralistic. Yes, that's the main problem of obviously the European Commission. I think they they, they, they received two uh, two issues from Hungary in recent two or three years. Yeah. I can't, can't I would know it better and there's no reaction. Yes, it also was uh, about the state aid, uh, uh, state aid used to, 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 uh, um, yes. to promote the pro-governmental media. 
Catherine, yes, you want yes, to say I, I, Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, uh, to say something on this, um, because uh, firstly, uh, Thomas said that uh, um, we are much ahead <laughs> than Poland. Uh, yes, uh, when, when in, in luckier times when we, we could meet in the press room of the Commission of the, or the Council, I always told the Polish colleagues that, come on, sit down, I, I will let you uh, know what comes next <laughs> before, before yeah, because I remember. Is my, 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 much ahead than, than you are in this. And Andrei yes, uh, as you know, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the Orban regime is, is yeah. much ahead in destroying the press freedom and undermining democracy and rule of law, as you all know. Um, uh, when it comes to the uh, complaints, yes, uh, Hungary or uh, Hungarian NGOs and, and uh, uh, a politician, a, a former MEP, submitted uh, two complaints uh, to the European Commission on the illegal state aid um, to the public media. Uh, and also to the pro-government media. Uh, one of them was submitted in 2016, still no response from the Commission, no and the other one is another one is uh, 2019. So when I hear uh, the Commission saying that we have no competences in the um, in, in um, um, the freedom of press or media. Uh, 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 freedom, uh, then I always remember that uh, even uh, in those uh, fields where, where the Commission has competences, uh, they tend uh, not to use it. Thank you. Uh, Marine, uh, I wanted to ask you, um, do, do you feel that, uh, because obviously, you know, it's clear that, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the rich and the powerful are, are putting pressure on the media, uh, in, in many different uh, ways and on many different levels. Uh, do, do you feel that uh, journalists themselves uh, are to be blamed partly for uh, recent developments in the sense that, you know, one of the things I would like to ask you, this is a discussion we're having a lot in, in my newspaper, for example, about, you know, if there shouldn't be a clearer division between what I would call news coverage, right? And for example, uh, you know, everything that is related to opinions. Uh, 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 which is, this, this division used to be quite strong. And you see in recent years that it's becoming less and less strong. I mean, do, do, yeah. do, do you see this as a, as a bad development? Yeah, maybe just before I get to that point, you also asked the, yeah. Kathleen about objectivity. And I think yeah. um, even the most, those of us who are, you know, purists and believe that journalism is about speaking truth to power, I think the idea and the notion of objectivity, um, it just isn't true. Um, as journalists, every day in newspapers, we have to make an editorial choice about what we cover. And that also means a choice about what we don't cover. Um, and um, even, you know, I, I would like to think of uh, most of my colleagues are people who are fair and accurate and balanced. But the notion that we are somehow objective uh, truth speakers is just, it, it isn't true and it isn't something we should aspire to. But of course, there are always degrees of what objectivity we should aspire to. And, you know, when it comes to the questioning of truth, we've clearly moved into a way which is which is um, at the more extreme end about, you know, questioning facts. Um, I think the role of opinion and news, one, it depends very much on the media cultures of certain countries. So being in Brussels, I see how other countries have very strict Chinese walls between news and opinion. Um, the UK has always been slightly greyer and there's always been a scope for reporters to have opinions. I have written opinion pieces in the Financial Times despite being a reporter, not necessarily on the things that I cover, but but an angle that I provide on something, something that's personal to me, etc. So there's scope to do that. I think the thing that has changed is social media. Um, and a lot of people who were just news reporters who would maybe 20 years ago only write the news have now become media personalities in and of themselves. Um, you know, there are reporters, broadcast uh, reporters, newspaper journalists who have hundreds and thousands of people following them on Twitter because they provide them the news. It means that they they are divorced in some senses from the organization that they work for, despite the fact you only follow Laura Kuzberg because she works at the BBC or somebody else because they work at the New York Times or whatever. Um, it's created, I think, it creates a problem for the employers, for the newspapers, when they have huge superstar journalists and sense is brilliant but you can slip up and send a tweet late at night maybe was not you know on brand um 
and people will consider that to be like the view of the BBC. The BBC in the UK has, is part of a huge national conversation about uh, whether or not it's biased, it is funded by the taxpayer, whether it has a duty to be objective. Should you be objective on subjects like climate change? Should you have both sides of views when, for example, all the facts are, you know, all science claims are some things are just true and other things aren't? Um, it is an issue. But, but, but I, 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 I think the BBC uh, actually took the even took the step now to to kind of prove that, that they basically told that their journalists cannot they cannot be on Twitter anymore. I mean, uh, what well, their journalists are on Twitter. Well, I think they, they there are stricter social media. Um, every rules. newspaper, I think, yeah. has, has this has this internal process of deciding what you can yeah. or cannot say as a BBC journalist, as a Wires journalist, as someone at the FT. Uh, there is slightly, I think, more scope to have opinion than, say, if I worked at maybe an American newspaper where there's a much stricter line on opinion. I personally, you know, I enjoy the grey area more. It does open you up to way more scrutiny. But for me, as somebody as a news reporter, I, I do report about things on my daily beat. But I also realise that I see things in a slightly different way to lots of my other colleagues. And that, I mean, why is that? One of that is probably generational. Um, I am a bit younger than a lot of people in the FT in my newspaper. And the other one is that I do hear words, particularly when it comes to things like um, speaking my minorities, a diversity, racism, and they sound differently to my ears. And if a newspaper is about having a diversity of not only of opinions, but also the people that work there, I think that we need to realize that if we want the journalists to look like the countries, the continent or the, or the societies that we cover, then with it will have to come a natural diversity of thought and opinion and the rest of it. And, um, you know, I work in a predominantly um, white media landscape in Brussels. I mean, Brussels is, is, is um, it, it doesn't look like Europe. Um, and in some senses for people that doesn't really matter, but I, it matters when I think of Black Lives Matters happening in the summer. I think Brussels is probably the only place in the world where the entire global um, debate about racism didn't even seem to touch this hermetically sealed place. And for me as a journalist, I found that completely bizarre. And, it, and, and you have to ask why. Um, mm -hmm. Why is that? Is it is it because these things don't matter? I mean, clearly they do, but, you know, um, so there are very striking instances when you see what homogeneity in the journalist core means for the things that we produce and the things that we put out. Um, not that I'm going to take it upon myself to be some kind of, you know, um, the in-house social justice warrior, but I think it's worth just asking the question why and just challenging people's okay. perceptions of why, because which is what journalists should do all the time. Yes. Uh, 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 David, uh, Marine already touched upon uh, the social media phenomenon a little bit and obviously uh, uh, there is another phenomenon related to it and this is the fake news uh, uh, phenomenon. Um, you know, to, uh, is, w w how, how, do you, how do you look at this? Is there something we can, can do about it? Do you again see a role for the European Commission there? Well, again, let's remember that, that fake news is sort of the new way of denouncing us and what we do. But there's always been slogans like this, yellow journalism. Uh, now it's fake news. Anything anybody doesn't like is fake news. You know, to, to add on a couple of points that Maureen was making, I'd say that uh, we can probably agree that there is no pure objectivity. But objectivity, of course, is very useful as an aspiration, as a goal that we're working toward all of the time. And uh, similarly, as she said, you know, we have to cover a diverse world. And so I often say when these discussions come up that, um, you know, in journalism, uh, it, diversity is not a question of, of morality, although it is the good, right, equitable thing to promote. In fact, it's a journalistic imperative. If we don't have diverse staff in our news organizations, we cannot cover a diverse world because each reporter does come uh, with their own perspective and experiences there. Now, how do you fight back? It, it's a really interesting question. Where is the role of the commission? You know, I have some doubts about how far the commission or, or any government entity can reach into uh, the world of, of privately owned media. We've seen, you know, Fox News in the, in the US or any of the Murdoch owned properties. You know, they may change their take one way or another, but if they're acting as a mouthpiece, it's obviously something that is outside the control, uh, unlike, say, uh, Russia Today or any of the, you know, the, the first channel uh, that's controlled and, and so close to the Kremlin. Where I do think the commission could do more immediately 
is in modeling best behavior as a government entity itself. So for example, one of the things that drives me crazy in my everyday work is when salaried commission spokespeople, these are people who are paid by the taxpayers of Europe to provide information to journalists on a daily basis, don't wanna give their names. That undermines the credibility of all of our work. There is no reason why all of these things shouldn't be on the record. So the more that the entire Brussels bubble can both speak truth, aspire to speak truth, at least as they understand it, and put that on the record, there's no reason that that kind of behavior can't begin immediately. It, it goes back to the point about everybody trying to control the story, even the most progressive-minded, democratically-minded politician often wants to control how they will be portrayed in the press. And I would suggest that maybe if you let go of that a little bit, do a great job and just put it all out there, you'll be portrayed as you wish more times than not. And there will be bigger, larger benefits to society, democracy, journalism as a whole than operating in this quasi secrecy, always trying to pull on puppet strings, create you know some kind of theatrics and scene because the, the, you want the non-paper understood this way or that way. Most often, even when people are speaking anonymously to us and we play this game, we're complicit in this every day. Sometimes we don't have a choice. We know who's talking. And I don't think things would change all that much if folks fessed up about that in 98% of the cases. There are times obviously discretion matters, but at the very least, the commission could start before it even attempts to, to you know, bring in the state aid rules and other things, which, which are important if it's possible, if it's feasible, but to start by in Brussels, you know, where national capitals don't necessarily always want to model this best behavior when it comes to dealing with the press, the European Union definitely could. Yes. Uh, uh, recently, there was a very interesting um, uh, article uh, uh, from Margaret Sullivan in the Washington Post. Um, on uh, on uh, She's the media columnist of the Washington Post. And she was basically uh, uh, saying that... Um, uh, you know, even though Trump uh, is going to leave now, apparently, uh, you know, his, uh, his, um, yeah, the, 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 the widespread disinformation system and that he, that he uh, fostered on is going to be there. Right? It's something that we will have to deal uh, uh, with uh, also in the future. And the same applies a bit to, to Europe. I mean, people might come and go, but it seems that we, we are stuck with this uh, disinformation system. And she's, for example, saying that, you know, uh, journalists should be bolder, more direct, uh, really telling it like it is, right? Uh, uh, staying away from the false equivalence thing, uh, 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 and and be more passionate about what 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 they're writing about. Because in the end, she's also describing that this polarization, populism, it is more attractive uh, uh, than you know politicians who have a very reasonable, you know, quiet argument about something. So what, 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 what's, your, what's your view uh, on, on, on this? I mean, how are we going to, how, how, what is the journalism of the future going to look like if we are, you know, stuck in this world like this? Can I, can I jump in? Yeah, sure. Um, I think there is, um, there's, a, there's a, something that I've seen recently is that for liberal progressive newspapers like my own, it's very easy to cover something in Poland and Hungary because it's sort of far away. I think Brexit was probably the moment where lots of newspapers like the Financial Times, who for you know decades since their existence have been pushing uh, and promoting the idea of a European Union and European cooperation, when the country in which the newspaper is based then rejects that notion quite overtly in a referendum, you have this kind of moment of crisis saying, well, we don't seem to understand the country that we live in. Um, I think there's probably an equivalent that happened in the US. and. There has been a tendency that I've seen to overcorrect this by saying, OK, we don't understand it. And clearly we've been telling our readers for a long time the European Union is great. They've rejected it. Why? And asking why is definitely the right response to it. But I'm sure, Stefan, you will see that, you know, in, in the Netherlands, when I read uh, a lot of reporting around the far right and the populace, there is an idea that um, someone like Geert Wilders crept up onto the scene and was ignored by the mainstream media. Um, or, um, sorry, um, uh, someone like uh, Pim Fortuyn or Thierry Van Gogh, people who've always had a very kind of um, a brash uh, right wing sensibility and very provocative. And because that was missed, 
there was a sense that you needed to overcorrect by probably applying too much media attention to potential challenges or the heirs to these people like Wilders and maybe Baudet, who was very much a media phenomenon. And I think that tendency to overcorrect um, is is a dangerous one, and we do, I think the future of journalism is realizing how not to do that. So you know, in in the in, so in how, Europe, how do you do that? How do you do that? In Europe, in Western Europe, there is, I think, this thing that there are the legitimate grievances of an angry majority who are kind of railing against globalization, and we need to understand them and put their grievances forward and and say that we are. This is how we do fair and objective, balanced journalism. Uh, I, I still think that that's something that it's not the, that should not be the guiding principle that, that we have to correct a mistake that we made before. I think we just have to ask the right questions all the time. I mean, why are uh, the angry white majority scared about migration? Is it because migration is a real threat to their livelihoods? Uh, in some cases, yes. Is it because, I mean, we had a Brexit referendum where the government of the United Kingdom, which was campaigning to stay in at the time, David Cameron's government, also had a huge campaign about the fact that there are taking all the uh, uh, sort of funding of health benefits and doing health tourism in the UK, which was just not true. Yes. Um, yes. Um, and and so how do you find the balance? I think you have to ask the question and not feel that you're carrying the burden of a previous editorial mistake that you may have made or something that you may not have missed. I think, and that, so I mean, and, a, and the renewal, yeah. the renewal so of journalists, friendship. having... Yeah. yeah, having people coming in and out of your newsrooms. I mean, a lot of people stay in their jobs for a really long time. They cover their beat for decades and decades. Um, at the FT, I think it's quite helpful that you're basically asked to move on every five years because they, there is a sense in which you kind of get stuck knowing the story and then you become desensitized sometimes to things because you've seen it and heard it all before. So the renewal of, of, of newsrooms having people change jobs, come in, having newer and fresher perspectives, not just on the opinion pages, but actually people who write the news and who might see the world differently. I think that's one way you can sort of try and get over this, um, sometimes the, the historic burdens that you might bear as a newspaper because you called something wrong. And it's something we all live with because, you know, as journalists, when we write things, they do have consequences. I'm sure the FT wrote a lot of stories, broke lots of stories about the UK and the EU, which in hindsight, you could say, may have contributed to Brexit, including, you know, huge things like the rebate, um, you know, the David Cameron's fights yes. about getting um, rebate surcharges and all the rest of it. Yeah. But I do worry, yeah. Stefan, that, yeah. that there is, you know, that we can end up paying too much attention to what are essentially falsehoods and nonsense. At some point, and, and you mentioned uh, Margaret Sullivan, who I knew when she was public editor of the New York Times, and she was as vulnerable as any of us are to her sources being wrong. If she's trying to figure out what happened on the reporting of a certain story, she's relying on sources just like any other journalist. And you do have a situation where, again, if the root cause of some of what Maureen was just describing is just flat out racism. I don't know how much we can spend our time writing and writing and writing about racism. We can do it till the end of time. And we're not going to change the fact that at core, many people are in fact racist. It may be that we have to find a completely different way of looking at the world and looking at what we do, finding ways to put aside a whole lot of misinformation where there are people saying, well, we didn't, you know, we haven't understood well enough the Trump base and what's going on there. If, if part of that base is sort of steeped in complete lies, disinformation and fantasy, I'm not sure how much time we should give to that. The same thing, it's, it's very difficult because how do you cut off you know, the president of the United States when he's speaking, but television networks started to do that, deciding that they're just not gonna broadcast you know, stuff when it's completely flat out fantasy, nonsense, you know, crazy talk. And so there is this question and a challenge to us, which is about how do you reframe, refocus in directions where you're covering real issues that matter. I think one way to do it is to spend more time focused on issues than personalities. Too often we get caught up in these personalities, whether it's a Le Pen or a Trump, and we're focused on, on the person rather than the, the, the core guts of the issue. We did this over and over again. How many times did people report that Trump lied about this or that fill in the blank? At some point, it's not news anymore. And we actually don't treat other stories that way. If, if something happens mm -hmm. a zillion times, we start ignoring it normally, right? It's the, it's the exceptional things that typically make news. So I think we have to yes. figure out where certain things are no longer interesting, so to speak, and find the way forward. But it's very, very difficult. Thanks a lot. Uh, I, I would like to move on uh, to the questions now uh, from the audience. I, I just have no idea how this is going to work. 
um, maybe the the you know the 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 guys from the permanent representation can help me out here. Yeah, uh, because I, I I understand that you know that that there was going to be the possibility to have questions at the end. We're all journalists. Maybe we can just ask each other questions, given that's what we do. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we want to get the audience involved. But I don't see the audience, which, you know, this is such a COVID typical nightmare. <laughs> okay. I, I don't really know how we're going to do this. Uh, so, uh, so you know, uh, let's maybe just, uh, uh, yeah, move on with our own questions. Uh, they can't log in. They're saying that they can't. Okay, so, okay. Okay, well, good. Okay, anyway, guys, um, I think, uh, ah, yeah, I've got a question, sorry. Yeah, so I've got a question here from uh, Ria Katz from uh, fine, uh, Financiële Dagblad, Dutch newspaper. Uh, nice, nice to have you with us, uh, Ria. Uh, she's saying like that. I was extremely surprised by the fact that the FT gave in to Macron. Did the paper had to do that because it was afraid to lose access to their sources in the French government? And if yes, isn't this comparable to the practice of buying advertisement space in newspapers in Poland and Hungary? I think the question is directed to you, Marine. <laughs> okay. Um, again, I'm not here to speak for the for the FT. Um, I'm here in a personal capacity. Uh, my understanding is that no, there was not a request from uh, Mr. Macron to remove an article. And the article was removed and reviewed by the FT for its errors. Um, I think the very valid question is, though, is, is, is what kind of pressure are journalists under when they could be threatened with the loss of their access um, or they can be um, you know shut out from certain media briefings and all the rest of it I'm sure this stuff goes on on a daily basis I don't think and I'm pretty certain that is not what was happening in this case but again it's another it's a good question which points at the vulnerability that I think a lot of my colleagues who cover domestic affairs have with their immediate sources who are the people in power and also the people who provide them with information um i'm and you know i've heard uh, maybe not apocryphal probably real stories about a uh, practice like this happening in the european commission where some of who might have uh, written a story which was just too close to the bone managed to get a leak which was a, a bit too sensitive um then being told well you're not going to be able to uh, attend any more of off the record, all these types of things. I mean, David uh, hinted at the fact that there is a lot of this kind of cloak and dagger stuff. And a lot of the time, there just isn't the need for it. This European Commission president, for example, has been on an anti-leak um, uh, crusade to try and weed out people inside the commission, commission officials who are caught um, handing documents, not only to journalists, but also to the governments, their permanent representations um, that are in this town. Um, is it a helpful endeavor? I, I This is the leakiest town in the world. So even the anti-leak directive managed to leak. So, you know, good luck with that one. Do, do, do any of the other panel members have been, uh, you know, uh, put under uh, pressure from uh, politicians to have articles retracted uh, and are willing to talk about it now? <laughs> uh, and and how, does your, how does your newspaper react in situations like that? No, I don't Catherine? remember any. No, I don't remember. Oh. Uh, I cannot yeah. share with you any, any. And uh, once, once happened to me, but that is not not about an article. I used to work for Nepsabachak, the newspaper which is closed. Now it was closed uh, uh, in 2016. It was the largest newspaper of, of the country that time, an independent one, an opposition one. And uh, after the newspaper was closed, I still continued to take part in, in, in press briefings in the Hungarian permanent representation because I, I had a badge. Uh, uh, first of all, and, and secondly, I asked uh, the people there, let me continue my work. Uh, I hope in, in a couple of months I will, I will find a new job. And um, then uh, a press conference of Prime Minister Orban was announced um, in the permanent representation after a European Council meeting. So he held his press conference not in the Council meeting, be, uh, building, but in the Perm Rep. And then I was invited. And when his press officer, his 
spokesman learned about my presence, they asked me to leave. Yeah. And that was a big, a big, big issue then. So um, I left, and they, th then they called me back. So I met the prime minister, and uh, he sort of apologized for that. But it, that was not about the, not about uh, uh, an article, but uh, yeah. just about the newspaper. Thank you, Catalin. I'm going to do one more question, and then and then we're going to uh, close the debate. Um, I have a question here. Uh, yeah, this one we kind of answered already, but the last question would be, everyone is talking about their own country, island. What about cross-border collaboration? And if I may add to that, you know, is this, you know, the, the word solidarity, should there be more solidarity between journalists uh, in, these, uh, in these times? What do you, what do you think about it, uh, Tomek? Obviously, but the question is what what this solidarity would mean. Uh, I think that uh, speaking from the Polish point of view, I, I, the, the, in, also I'm, I'm talking at the personal capacity, but for Gazeta Wyborcza, it was also uh, uh, yes uh, the 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 the, um, the kind of the moral obligation to cover. Uh, the threats or dangers or risks uh, uh, for for journalists in other countries. I think that the uh, developments of Hungarian uh, mass media market uh, and freedom uh, of speech in Hungary has been yes covered by by Gazeta Wyborcza uh, the, yes more extensively than in other uh, mass media in the world, and uh, that is a kind of the solidarity just to just to cover uh, just to cover the. Uh, the, the threats. Uh, obviously yes, I, yes I, I remember, of course, we are talking about the European Union directly before Brussels. I worked in Moscow and I remember how, how also important for them was to, to be covered, uh, to, to, to have their problems covered by, 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 by European Western press, which Poland was yes, considered as a, as a West by, by, by them. It helps if not in the concrete way, it also helps morally. And it's, yes, it seems it's important, yeah. And, and, and let me add to that, that actually my newspaper, NRSA, once we, we, we worked together with Gazette of in the past, you know, to, to, we did a story about, you know, uh, EU subsidies for political uh, parties uh, on the European level. And it was a great story, but yeah. it's true that, that, uh, that, uh, that you know, that the language barriers are, are always quite big in, uh, in, uh, in the EU. This seems to be uh, the curse we have to live with. Uh, somehow, uh, maybe uh, David, you want to add something to this, or, 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 you know, about no, I mean, your, 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 yeah, go. There, there is. Um, we have seen quite a bit more of this sort of uh, consortium work. Um, sometimes yeah. the challenge for us at, at Politico is that because we're we're in English, we're we're a competitor with everybody, and so nobody wants to partner up with us uh, because we're we're sort of occupying this new globish uh, space. But uh, where, you know, in other cases, there might be an Italian, a, a French, a, an English language uh, outlet all together. But um, there's no question that there's more of this collaborative journalism. I can tell you, though, that even partnering with our uh, colleagues back in Washington to write about the EU for an American audience and to then write about uh, the EU for the EU audience, it's really a lot harder sometimes than it seems. So, again, one of these yeah. things that we really have to figure out what is the way to do it that works not just across languages, but across uh, cultures and, and political sensibilities to make it work. But there's no question harnessing that power is the future where we treat stories, you know, now uh, international journalism used to be postcards from a faraway land. I don't think there's any room for that anymore in this globalized age where anybody can turn on the live stream and see what's happening on the streets of Minsk or, uh, or in uh, Portland, Oregon or wherever some action is, having, uh, is happening. So there is a need for cooperation. Uh, the question is, how do we make it work for all of our readers and viewers? Thanks a lot. Um, I, I want to thank all the panelists for, for sharing their experiences and opinions and uh, the, the, the audience, which must be really gigantic, even though I can't see it. But, it, you know, it, uh, for watching, you know, it, it, was, it was really a very interesting conversation, I think. Uh, I think it's fair to say that, you know, the next couple of years are not going to be easy. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm especially looking at, at you know, our, 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 our guests from Central Europe, you know, who sometimes are, are going through a bit of a rougher time uh, than the rest of I think, and, and we should, you know, uh, show solidarity and support for them as much as we can. Uh, it, it was a real pleasure to see all you guys again. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to, to meet in Brussels 
very soon, you know, maybe we can have a beer. Uh, and I just wanted to, I, I just wanted to say that, um, uh, the, the, you know, the, the next couple of days, uh, the Netherlands and UNESCO are still organizing the World Press uh, uh, Freedom Conference 2020. And you can go to WPFC2020.com to see the scheduled events, lectures and talks and follow the live stream. So, you know, enjoy and, uh, you know, thanks a lot. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.